Cool. All right. Hey, good morning. See some familiar faces, so it's very, very cool. Uh, it's been a minute since I've been back in New York, so glad to be here. Uh, before getting started, um, just a quick show of hands. Um, how many of you in the room are computational designers? Just put your hand up real quick. Self-identifying, cool. Um, how many of you in the room have used a computational design tool maybe to create a product of some sort? Yeah. How many of you have built a computational design tool for someone else to use? Awesome, you can put your hands down. All right, I'm Ronnie. Uh, thank you for the CD fam uh, team for putting the show on, right, and for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm a computational designer too, uh, and I'm also the founder of Mode Lab, uh, a sustainable innovation company based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, for the past two decades, I've worked alongside visionary brands to scale the value and impact of computational design by focusing on two key issues, what products to create and how to create them. So to start, uh, let's take a step back in time to a very interesting moment. In the 1960s, computer technology began outpacing the speed of computer programming. The explosive growth of, com of um, this computing power and, sorry, in the 1960s, computer technology began outpacing the speed of computer programming. The explosive growth of computing power and new languages uh, presented opportunities that the emerging programming community was, will, uh, was really ill-equipped to exploit. Um, and it was such a threat that in 1968, uh, the NATO Science Committee held the first international conference on software engineering, where 52 global experts would come together for four days um, to talk about a really uh, uncomfortable problem, right? And what are, are the solutions to sort of solve for it? Douglas McElroy, uh, who was a prominent mathematician, engineer, and programmer of the time, suggested uh, component-based development to speed up programming's potential by making code reusable, thus making it more efficient and easier to scale. Component-based development lowered the effort and increased the speed of software development, allowing software to utilize the power of modern computers more effectively. And in reflecting on this pivotal moment in time, uh, Edgar Dijkstra would remark that as long as there were no machines, programming was no problem. When we had a few weak computers, progr programming became a mild problem. And now that we have gigantic pro uh, computers, programming has become an equally gigantic problem. This growing disparity between the hardware evolution and software stagnation of the time was not just a minor issue, it threatened to stifle the potential of computing. This existential threat would uh, later become known as a software crisis. Now fast forward 50 years and we're experiencing a similar challenge, but this time in design. Computational design is struggling to scale up because it still operates in a bespoke fashion. We're creating unique solutions for individual problems. And so today's talk is about how to operationalize computational design to maximize its value and impact in this new technological era. Now everyone in attendance is uh, well aware that computational design has become a hot topic these days, right? Uh, and for good reason. Computational design's market presence is expanding, right? Businesses across industries are investing in computational design as it is clearly established that it enables a fundamentally different set of capabilities for design organizations. Capabilities such as richer interactions between brands and consumers, data being infused throughout the product pipeline, and differentiation in the market through product innovation. The trajectory of growth typically looks something like this. New roles are defined, new resources are added to a growing computational design team. The team becomes more embedded throughout the organization, typically servicing multiple groups and their product needs. And KPIs are defined and measured to evaluate the effectiveness of computational design efforts across products and platforms. But the reality of the environment we are working in is just way too challenging, right? The problems we are solving are becoming more complex, 
We're incorporating new materials. We have multiple manufacturing processes. And the, there are evolving design requir requirements and uh, kind of rigorous uh, standards to hold up. Rapid consumer demand, technological advancements, and environmental and regulatory requirements are, are bringing about tons of volatility. And there's uncertainty everywhere. It's stemming from potential supply chain disruptions, market shifts, and an evolving set of required skill sets to either learn or potentially be left behind. Lastly, there's a growing disconnect between stakeholder expectations and what is realistically achievable given time, budget, and resource constraints. Organizations often struggle to unlock the full value of their investment in computational design, not because of a lack of product strategy or the computational designers they hired, but because computational design as a key organizational capability has not been set up for success organizationally. At ModeLab, we build systems that support computational design teams. The core of our work centers around integrating an operational layer within the enterprise. And we refer to this as computational design ops. So computational design ops systematically orchestrates and optimizes product, process, and people to amplify computational design's value within fast-changing organizations and markets. And analogous to how DevOps has revolutionized the development process through its agile and iterative approach, CD Ops empowers organizations to rapidly scale and make iterative improvements to computational design processes across teams. And this computational design ops framework is experienced in the enterprise through uh, the interaction between uh, three integrated components, uh, design systems, pattern language, and new practices and behaviors. A design system. A design system bridges the gap between the physical and digital domains of the solutions computational designers create. Think of it as like the glue between what we're gonna make and how we're gonna make it. A design system is compo typically composed of things like principles, right? Why, why we work the way we work, patterns, the articulation of the problems to solve and how to go about doing so. Toolkits, reusable assets that a team who is not actually a computational designer or have that capability on the team can use, right? Templates for having to uh, not start a project from scratch every time. Guidelines which loosely define the ways in which things should be um, created. Team learnings and resources. And it can also include things like a lexicon of terms, helping to ensure that all stakeholders have a foundational understanding of computational design and its associated concepts. We use design systems to increase consistency, efficiency, and scalability within the teams we work with who are using these advanced capabilities that we're hearing about today, right, to bring products to life. It serves to connect teams by providing a shared language and a reference point that spans teams. By systematizing computational design, design systems enable teams to work more collaboratively. It streamlines the design process and it lessens the effort required to get started. Now, one of the key components within a design system is a pattern. Okay, and a design pattern is the reusable form of a solution to a design problem in different ways. But the way that we typically provide an initial, initial structure to patterns is around four uh, touch points. First, uh, functional patterns relate to how a product should behave and how it should perform. Perceptual patterns, which is the ethos of a product or the brand, depending how you think uh, uh, about a brand. Um, and it forms the patterns that together shape how a product is perceived. Um, platform patterns, which are the met materials, the methods of make, the data models that you use to create products. And domain patterns, which are the categories of products, right? Uh, the types of products that you're creating. Um, we've done a lot of work with Nike in the past, um, so I'm going to use uh, a past project as, to, as a sort of an example of this thinking. Um, so domain patterns, right? Uh, track and field. 
100 meter race. Functional patterns, we need to minimize weight, maximize stiffness, and tune flexibility. Platform patterns, a data model centered around a specific geometry kernel. Method of make involving both rapid prototyping through additive manufacturing and injection molding. The materials that it is made of. And lastly, perceptual patterns like brand requirements, needing to feel a certain way, and having a certain kind of look. These patterns extend beyond just the types of function that you might see on the surface of the product, but also the functions that live uh, between products, right? Things like incorporating sizing and how to grade computationally a product so that it doesn't just meet the requirements of one size and then get non-uniformly graded across all the size run, but each one can be unique to the unique functional requirements of that particular size. These functional patterns, when thought of in the context of a new domain, another category of race are extensible, right? And they can be reused in order to be able to uh, apply patterns that you've created within one product and one domain of use into new ones. And working with patterns is a really interesting thing, right? Because patterns, as you create them, they also have to live somewhere, right? And so a pattern library comes to life where all of the ways that you're solving things as a team go and live and they evolve. And out of that pattern library, patterns are assembled into different new products where each product will also yield additional patterns, right? In working with patterns, a language will emerge that is the embodiment of an organization's design patterns brought to life in the product context. And this language is an ownable asset in the market. It scales across product categories, seasons, right? And years upon years, right? So don't forget that a pattern for one thing is scalable within the context of other things. And as that happens, there's a new language that will emerge that you can own. So patterns define how you solve problems computationally over time. They form a design language for your organization. But the core of CD Ops, the experience that's felt, really centers around a human element and a fundamentally different way to approach the product creation process. We center this around two interconnected loops, one about launching products and one about landing products, right? At the start of a particular product, we assess the product, what are its needs, and we try to identify the patterns that live within that product and the patterns that live beside or adjacent to that product, right? We map out of our pattern library the patterns that we can use, right, and reuse, thereby accelerating, right, our speed of innovation and allowing us to get further much faster. And we use those to then assemble and build first proofs of life, right, which then drive the development of the product over time. As we successfully land a product, right, we do another assessment of the product. We try to understand what patterns were born, in, which we can publish and deploy, which then increases the scale and impact of the work that we are doing as a team. So practices and behaviors define how a design system evolves and how teams experience this evolution over time. So CD Ops provides a framework to create better products faster by making design reusable. And reusability is what makes scale possible, right? And a pro tip for you, um, if you're already using a lot of cool software and really, really deep in the process, um, this kind of thinking transcends software, right? It's a framework that you can apply uh, regardless of the tools you use, the industry you're operating within, or the size of your team. But a question that comes up a lot whenever um, you know, we're, we're talking to brands about integrating this kind of a framework into the organization is, you know, this sounds like a lot of process. You know, it sounds like a whole lot of stuff that's not the product. And it's concerning, right? I mean, of course, everyone's concerned about having too much to do when it's not the thing you're trying to actually create, right? It's a, a, you know, a, lot, of, a lot of debt in the workflow. 
Um, but if you perform a, a product audit, uh, when you go back to the office, um, you're gonna come across a handful of tools that are similar that you're using, a ton of permutations of workflow, depending on how many people are on the team, that can be an order of magnitude greater, right? And then if you multiply that by every product you're supporting, right, you'll realize how inconsistent, incomplete, and difficult it is to maintain computational design within your organization, right? And so the thinking evolves from rather than focusing on products where the effort is always going to be the same and increasing over time, right, will be present and increasing, focus on systems because there is an inflection point, right, where over time the effort is beginning, will begin to plateau because of the reusability factor. So some things to consider, uh, if this is at all uh, something that sounds interesting to you. Um, I wanna share a couple of, uh, of things uh, th about implementing CDOps into your uh, process. Um, the first thing is um, patterns are everywhere, right? And so you really wanna look somewhere unexpected, okay? Sorry, I've got a little notification pop up. Try to look outside of the product Look at the user, look at the data, look at the assets that you already have within your team that you can leverage and integrate into the products that you're creating. But also look adjacent to the product, right? Look somewhere that is not the physical product. You know, Look to nature, look in other areas, and try to use patterns that you find there to breathe new life and new ideas into the work that you're doing. Um, patterns are extensible, right? Try integrating the patterns you're creating across domains, right? Uh, beyond just sizing, try to take sizing, right? And then multiply that times category of use, right? Thereby expanding the reach of the tools that you're building and the impact you can have uh, in the products that you're creating. And your pattern language is an asset, right? You want to evolve it um, and you want to own it, right? So at the Olympics, we use this type of thinking and these types of tools in order to not just bring one product to life, but to bring an entire uh, you know, smattering of products to life in a fraction of the time that it would have taken to create just one, right? But remember that pattern, uh, design systems are built for scale, right? And so the patterns that you're creating, you wanna capitalize on that momentum. Um, and the speed to market, right, that you uh, now have possible through the use of this type of an operational framework uh, is something that can, lever you can be leveraged on the success of a pinnacle event like the Olympics, driving the product then into market. So uh, in closing, uh, I just want to throw out um, a, a quick four steps that you guys can take um, to start to integrate this uh, thinking into your process, right? Uh, it's, it's really pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Um, the first one, audit. Take a look at what are the parts of that product, how do they work, right? And how were they defined computationally? Then take, it the, take a look at the computational product you created to support the creation of that. Take a look at how you solve the problems. Are you solving them consistently? Is there anything you can reuse? Define the pattern language that already exists within your organization and try to then identify ways that you can codify that, right? Build a pattern library so you have somewhere to store all of this work, right? And be able to then reflect on its use through shared learnings to drive future pattern use and reuse. So if you want to learn more about how to integrate CDOps uh, into your process, you know, feel free to reach out. You can hit me up here. Also, I'm here for the next two days, so I uh, would love to grab a coffee. Thank you so much.